okay so thank you okay thank you everyone uh, for joining us on our second webinar uh, of the series galloping medtech industry and its evolution 1.0 uh, this is a very focused medtech law event uh, we want to we want to be a thought leader in this particular sector uh, with tons of experience on this panel uh, i think we'll be discussing few key issues and addressing certain certain issues in the industry and how we are maneuvering over those issues uh, to begin this webinar i'll welcome my managing partner mr nusrat hasan uh, to say a few words and then introduce the panel thank you pradnesh uh, uh, thank you for the introduction uh, with this i welcome the panelists and our participants for today's webinar which is the topic is laws relating to interaction with hcps which stands for healthcare professionals so today we are going to discuss the promotion advertisement and the various uh, activities of the medtech and healthcare companies towards the uh, towards the general public and healthcare professionals uh, which is a widely debated topic all around the world it is very imperative to understand the intricacies uh, relevance and implementation and regulation of such advertisement and awareness activities in the healthcare industry because it affects each and every individual in the society today of course we have a very esteemed panel of experts who will be sharing their ex insights and experience on various topics we have people from our indian subcontinent as well as the us so we will hear from how how hcps uh, and uh, how in both uh, very large countries this is uh, how 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 the laws have have evolved and developed and what are the regulations in both these jurisdictions and probably a few more uh, uh i would like to express my sincere appreciation to all speakers and participants for taking the, the time out to be part of this uh, part of this event your presence and contribution will undoubtedly make this webinar a valuable learning experience for everyone with this let me start by introducing the panelists i'll start with anuranjan prasad a good friend and i've known him for several years uh Anuranjan is a, the associate general counsel at Baxter International Inc. He's he's heading the legal function of Baxter in Southeast Asia, India, and Korea. He has over twenty two years of experience and has worked as in house counsel in various sectors like telecom, FMCG, healthcare, and real estate over multiple jurisdictions. Next, we have Meera Gupta. Ms. Gupta is a director, legal and compliance for Philips India. She has pursued and completed an LLB from Delhi University and further has obtained an LLM degree. She has over 19 years of experience in strategic planning and leadership, legal and corporate affairs, strategic advisory, and business restructuring. As you all know, Philips India is a large med tech industry, very relevant to, uh, for today's topic. Of course, joining us also is William William Tash, known more, uh, more by as Bill. Uh, Bill is the managing partner of the CTM Legal Group based in Chicago, Illinois. He has concentrated his practice in litigation at the U.S. State and Federal Court. Bill has completed his undergraduate degree with a major in political science and a minor in economics from Bradley University. He's uh, got he has obtained his JD from Loyola University's Chicago School of Law. Bill was named as a rising star by Thomson Reuters, Super Lawyers Magazines each year since 2015. With him, we have his colleague, Mr. Joe Colley. Mr. Colley is a partner at the CTM Legal Group based out of Chicago, of course, Illinois. He's completed his bachelor's degree in American government and politics from New York University and attained his doctorate in law from the Northwestern University Pritzker School in 2012. He has over 15 years of experience he has co-founded the CTM Legal Group to create a modern firm for changing the changer interconnected world. 
And of course, last but not the least, we have Pradnesh Varke from Link Legal. He's the associate partner, practice head, and has wide experience in the healthcare industry. He has spent several years in the healthcare industry. And with that, I will hand over the floor to Pradnesh and, uh, and over to you, Pradnesh. All right. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nushrat. Uh, thank you for the great introduction. And I again welcome everyone on this panel to be part of the second webinar of the series that we have for the MedTech Law event. So today's topic, uh, the webinar topic, is a very close one to this industry, uh, which is interaction with HCPs. Now, when we mean, uh, what we mean by interactions with HCPs? So it's a very unique industry where the devices or the products made by the manufacturing is sold to the consumer and the consumer is twofold. It can be a doctor or an HCP or a healthcare organization or it could be a consumer who is your retail purchaser. But even the retail purchaser of these devices is with an influence of the HCP or under the prescription of the HCP. So it becomes very imperative for all of all the medtech industry to have a great interaction and relationship with the HCPs, which also means that this, as this industry is heavily regulated, this relationship is also regulated. And this is exactly what we are going to be discussing in this today's webinar topic, that interaction with HCPs. Now, is it for the purpose of advertisement or is it, for, is it for the purpose of awareness? Uh, when we talk about advertisements, it can be known as promotional material. It could also mean that you are just letting the world know about your product. Uh, awareness could be with respect to your therapies. It could be with respect to the uh, innovation or the answers to the diseases and ailments that technology or innovation has brought in through these medical device industry. So the first part of, so the first segment is what we're going to discuss is with respect to advertisements and promotional activities. So as a first question, I'd like to, uh, you know, welcome Miru Gupta to this panel and would like to understand how can medical device companies balance the need for promoting their products with the ethical considerations and regulations related to advertising in the healthcare industry in India. So uh, just before you answer, let me just give you a small brief also on this particular question. Uh, because it's extremely important for company, medtech companies to adhere to utmost ethical standards. Uh, I think it is extremely important that we start on an ethical note for this uh, webinar as well. So Miru, please, uh, you know, uh, take the lead in that. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. <clears throat> thank you, Pratnesh, and thank you, Nusrat, for giving this opportunity. And uh, more than happy to be part uh, of, of this uh, panel discussion and uh, looking forward to learn and contribute uh, with the help of all the panelists out over here. So uh, before I actually move ahead, let me just give a small round of introduction about myself. This is Miru Gupta with approximately 18 plus years, 19 years of experience within healthcare and consumer electrical uh, services. I have been taking care of healthcare since quite a number of years now and been interacting with the HCPs, which is like healthcare professionals, and also the other support uh, functions in the healthcare professionals. So uh, if I talk about how we uh, in Philips handle these issues of interacting with healthcare professionals uh, or the advertisement with healthcare professionals, the first and the foremost important thing which we do is any advertisement going out in the market, uh, be that through print media, be that through uh, either a webinar sessions or be that through any electronic media, we ensure that that is vetted by the legal team. Because if, you know, something wrong goes out, uh, then, then that, of course, will cause such a huge reputational damage to the company that it, it takes years to get that mended. So uh, I'll say the first point which I would like to state is the legal vetting done by the internal in-house legal team. And then other best practices, which as as you know, which are which are non-negotiable within our company, is uh, you know we have come down come, come up with few clear do's and don'ts while interacting with the healthcare professionals. That what all you can do and what all you cannot do. Uh, this is as per the various protocols set 
uh, and not only set from the perspective of Indian market, but considering that Philips India is a global uh, Dutch-based uh, company, we, we follow the rules and regulations of UMDR regulations, et cetera, et cetera. So we ensure that be that privacy guidelines or FCPA guidelines, et cetera, are ensured. And uh, another thing which we do as a good practice within Philips is training. And training is given to our uh, all the employees. So not only to the sales, generally people end up giving training to the salespeople, but we end up actually as a mandate give training to sales, service, and all other external members who are going outside the office and meeting the healthcare professionals. Uh, then uh, goes without saying, we follow ASCII guidelines, we follow you know, consumer protection, UCM, MDPR, and other regulations which are applicable on a med tech company as well as a health, uh, as well as the HCPs to see and ensure that we are going as per the standard. And lastly, I think you know, I can comment that we uh, we ensure that if we are going ahead with an advertisement and few pictures of HCPs, et cetera, or any other display or views are taken by them, we take proper consent from the, them as a, for record purposes. So uh, that's it from my side. And Pradesh, it's good to clear that these are my views and not the views of Philips per se as a company, but this is what we follow within Philips uh, for interacting with HCPs. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Miru. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I think there is some issue with the screen. It keeps getting stuck. Uh, no worries. Yeah. No. Uh, so I want to give this disclaimer out as well for all the attendees that all the participants, uh, whatever views have been expressed, are their own, are not representation of their company. Uh, but I'm sure with Joe and William, the representation of CTM Legal. Uh, you know, but uh, for Phillips and Baxter, uh, thank you for Anuranjan and Miru to, you know, be part of this and we completely understand and probably give this disclaimer to all the attendees that these are their views which are being expressed in terms of the questions in the webinar that we have. Yeah. So thank you, Miru. Thank you so much. I think it's uh, quite essential to know that, you know, you have a do's and don'ts list. Uh, you have, a, you also mentioned about your playbook and the trainings that you do. Uh, I think those are some really good practices, which, you know, from ethical standards and from ethics and compliance in India, I think it's a very important aspect that everyone adheres to these ethics and compliances and also ensures uh, that everyone is aware about them. Like you cannot say that your ignorance uh, of law uh, cannot be a defense. In the same way, if you are not able to understand the ethics and compliance rules of the company, you cannot state that because of those, you know, you went into some misleading practices. So with that, I want to bring in Anuranjan uh, to this conversation. So welcome Anuranjan to the webinar. Uh, and my question to you is that what are best practices that these companies to follow when they're promoting their products through advertisements in the healthcare industry, right? Uh, and how do they ensure that these best practices are effective? Because I'm sure when these advertisements come to the legal department for clearing in terms of say claims or in terms of the content, in terms of the scripts, uh, there are definitely innovative ways of, you know, ensuring that we adhere to the guidelines, but we don't lose out on the uh, advertising intent of the company or the promotional intent of the company. So, and obviously we adhere to the ethical standards. So could you, you know, clarify some of the best efforts that you would have seen in India? And maybe, you know, you can give us a touch base of understanding on the South, uh, South Asian market as well. Okay. Thank you, Pradnesh and uh, Nusrat for, in, for inviting to be part of this panel, uh, along with our esteemed other panelists. I think it's a great opportunity. And uh, Pradnesh, you have given a disclaimer, so I'm not going to repeat <laughs> again, but, uh, uh, you know, these are my views and I'm just sharing it. You know, I, I, as you said, healthcare is pretty regulated industry. Uh, it is regulated and there are the channel of distribution necessarily constitutes of an intermediary. So basically the end user is a, is a patient, uh, but 
he we don't have a direct reach to the patient good bad i think they, there is most of the countries don't have a uh, direct to patient except for uh, us and new zealand that's to my understanding so we are not touching on that topic but when we are talking about advertisement i think you know advertisement which is normally understood in other industries it is little bit different in the pharmaceutical uh, advertisement whereas you know i remember that in when you i used to do matters related to restrictive or monopoly trade practices unfair trade practices it was said and accepted by court a puffing was allowed when it comes to healthcare it's absolutely not so it has to be very factual and and in when you're dealing with a advertisement which is more like of an information in a healthcare i broadly categorize under three categories one you know which is with respect to rules and regulations that are there which in context of india is drugs and cosmetics act or medical devices now which is coming into these they essentially constitute the rules and regulations so you even the product insert that you put it in the along with your product is an advertisement and would be covered under advertisement the second part that i can classify is rules and regulations governing the product claims when you are making claims you have to be careful that you are not making a claim that probably there is a claim related to cure eradication unless it is substantiated with some facts cure and and remedy is something that has to be very very careful so in essence it does not have to be false and misleading so it has to be truthful you you have to be there and then the third aspect that we can cover under advertisement is to how do we interact with healthcare professional so uh, from from that perspective this advertisement in healthcare industry i broadly classify it under these three categories to me whenever an advertisement is to come i think it needs to pass through all the tests which means that it needs to go through the uh through through the technical teams which can constitute from regulatory and medical functions they have to verify the content about it before landing on the legal legal stable so you you have that these are something which is correct can be substantiated and there is a basis of which you are making this claim. I, I means as i said that the this is probably the base for me for creating any kind of a material in the med tech industry or pharma industry whatever we may talk about it and this this is something that i highly recommend uh, for 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 the purpose of advertisement in healthcare or for product related to pharma or medical devices uh, we should have a process around it where we have the clearance of all the relevant stakeholders means i think we we i also want to say that legal does not have a solution for all this we are all lawyers here but i i am saying that probably as lawyers we cannot certify that the the truthfulness of the claim or the product that we are talking about it is very technical so there is no harm in creating a team who looks into these advertisements and the communication that we and to me that is the epitome or the best practice that needs to be uh, built in in any system to ensure that you have you are in compliance with the applicable law thank you thank you thank you ranjan i think that was very insightful uh, and i think some of the best practices that what you suggested uh, are very practical in nature uh, you know having a concentrated team looking into the claims or looking uh, into whatever material uh, going through a possible legal eye with respect to you know an understanding about the laws and the regulations uh, because as you would have seen in india you know we have various laws and uh, you know those are developing in this sector medtech industry is uh, already known as a sleeping giant and i think the government of india has been making a lot of efforts uh, in terms of facilitating uh, you know medtech industry uh, as well as the manufacturing in india right so i think 
Yeah, I, I completely agree, Pradnesh, but I think the government, I would have been more happy if government was more open towards the industry demand and the practical needs. You know, I, I am very passionate about this topic and I, I sometimes feel that we have to realize that if you are talking about the way the medical tech, bed tech industry is growing, you have to understand to keep up with pace you have to have a forum, you have to have a way to interact and educate even the prescribers. And that, unless the government understand that need and make things easy, there will always be a discussion, there will always be a debate between the legal department and the business, which unnecessarily creates delay. And probably sometimes the communication does not reach in the manner that it is required to be. So that that's my view that I feel about it. That oh, no, the government I, should be please. government should be a little more open towards the industry, and they mm -hmm. understand. I'm not saying that they, we should not be regulated. We should definitely be regulated. Uh, but yeah. No, I think that that is a great. I think Viru wants to come in. Yeah, Viru. Yeah. Please. So I I really echo uh, you know Aru Anuranjan's view on this. That legal cannot be a bottleneck for everything. Legal, we do not want to be called as those. We really want to support, but this is to be taken uh, from the perspective of the regulations which are there all around. And uh, the people need to understand that this is what law says. Yeah, over to you, Pratish. Thanks. No, I think, great. I think both the views are, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I've discussed this several times. Uh, in fact, I've had a good discussion with Anuranjan on this topic as well. And, uh, you know, uh, this is exactly what this, you know, webinar is for, right? Uh, in terms of getting the voice of the medtech industry out there, right? Uh, and uh, from legal standpoint, who better than the legal team itself, right? Uh, so with this conversation, I think I, we should move to a more developed country and where the practices are in a much advanced stage. Uh, so for this, uh, I'd like to bring in Joe. Joe, what... Could you just react to the question that we just discussed with Anurajan and Miru and probably give us some best practices that you would have already picked up? Because I think AI and other things are far ahead in US uh, than in uh, India at this point. Well, absolutely. I would. Uh, I was about to jump in too to echo uh, Miru and Anurajan because I, I mean we agree fully in some in some ways. Um, first, I would like to thank you, Pradnesh, for. Uh, inviting us and letting me join our steam panel here so we can discuss this is a great opportunity to talk about the industry and talk about the various challenges that I think are probably in a lot of ways similar in the US, but in some key ways, very different. Um, again, one, I just echo Miru and Anuranjan that um, I do feel the government's always very slow. The regulations are very slow to actually realize what is in fact happening and what is needed. Um, I mean, we AI, you mentioned AI, that being on the kind of the, the cutting edge right now in the United States, I have no idea where that's gonna go. But I do know that any of the regulations around it are gonna happen in 15 years after we've already figured out all the, the reality of it. So um, when we're talking about best practices and trying to hone this into the ethical considerations, particularly in advertisement, um, we are different that we do have direct to consumer advertisements here. Um, we have mostly in the pharmaceutical side and there's a difference between um, the reality for the pharmaceutical side and the um, medical device side um, is that our pharmaceutical companies spend a lot of money advertising directly to consumers and we get um, inundated with print media, um, radio, everything for uh, pharmaceutical, and you don't see that on the medical device side. So I was going to kind of focus more on the medical device side because um, best practices are, you know, there's no, they can't be, I guess, you know, for lack of a better term, bribing. There has to be very above board interactions with healthcare providers, but they serve an absolutely essential function, um, the advertisement and the educational side for those, these uh, medical devices. Um, it's complex. Even the surgeons and healthcare providers aren't fully 
informed. Usually the representative from the company is more informed about these devices and the surgeons and they will be in the, you know, in practice, they're in the operating rooms helping the surgeons take care of this stuff. So um, the ethical considerations on my side for this is basically best interest of the patient, making sure that we're following, complying with the regulations for our clients, but you know, our clients need to understand how to use these medical devices. And it is something that is essential to the function of our healthcare in the, in the United States. No, no, great. I, I think uh, having a direct to consumer being allowed in US, uh, I don't know when will that be permitted in India. It's, uh, but I think it's those are some of the learnings that, you know, we, in Indian regulations, we should look at. Uh, because it does happen. It's just that, you know, there is too much pressure to find a way to do it, uh, you know, and then rather than classifying content into different buckets, if we could have a clear cut guidance or regulations, or, you know, like Anuranjan was mentioning, I think that would have really help the industry uh, in terms of having a clear cut guidelines in terms of, you know, these kind of activities. Uh, because at the end of the day, what happens is that uh, there is an interpretation. And everyone has their way of looking at things. Uh, and that turns into a dispute, right? So I think those things can be reduced. Uh, and I really agree to it. So Joe, taking, you know, you taking your uh, you know, conversation ahead, I would like to, you know, get you on one more question with respect to US. So how do you, how do the laws and regulations, you know, which are related to gifts and advertising, gifts and advertising, right? Like in terms of say promotional gift, in some way brand recall, brand recall gifts, uh, in US, and what can we learn? Like, what are some of the? So I would again extend this question to the best practice scenario itself, but we with a different twist or a different angle to it, which is about you know gifts uh, or brand recall items that are being exchanged, you know, uh, by companies. Uh, to say HCPs or healthcare organizations, it could be during seminars, it could be during CMEs, uh, or it could be uh, you know in between any of the uh, awareness activities that they do. So how how is the scenario with respect to you know uh, providing gifts to HCPs? Yes, this is something that is was I believe a bigger issue twenty years ago or so. Um, the medical technology companies, the pharmaceutical companies, um, like you said, when they had an opportunity, whether it was at a seminar for continuing medical education, various conferences, or just right in the hospital or at the physician's uh, practice, would come in and give promotional uh, items. Um, but it went a bit beyond just traditional promotional items. Um, it was not uncommon for our healthcare providers to be invited to very luxurious dinners, be invited to conferences that was hosted by the um, tech, the companies themselves, where you know the doctors were staying at very nice hotels and fun vacation destinations, and be given thirty minutes education, but then having the rest of the day where all these fun activities are paid for by the companies. The changes in the law with the Sunshine Act um, and various kinds of reporting really um, tamp down on stuff that could be tangible benefits that are given to healthcare providers to induce them to, mostly in the pharmaceutical side, prescribe uh, certain drugs, um, but even in the uh, medical device side to encourage the utilization and adoption of different medical devices. Um, there, you know, a lot of ethical concerns there, um, and I think the change has been good. The change has been pushing our healthcare providers to, you know, or to I guess not be incentivized in any capacity by such things, or if they are, um, for it to be, you know, through the Sunshine Act, be accessible to the public how much each of these medical technology providers is paying to healthcare providers. Um, I want to kind of say, you know, that's a, it's a great thing that 
we don't want, you know, anything that might look like an, an unethical situation. However, the need remains for our companies to be able to promote and educate um, our healthcare providers. Um, it's kind of the, I would say it's best practice, it's, you know, it's twofold, obviously from a company standpoint that, you know, med medical technology companies were looking to help people and create products that are going to save lives and make life better, but also has to be profitable. So um, you, you can imagine in a world in the United States with direct consumer advertising and a pretty loose advertising regime up until there's some restrictions that came in recently, um, the incentive to try to promote you know, various devices or pharmaceutical production is, there's a lot of money at stake. Um, so the best practices we've learned, I can kind of bring back to it is, you regulate the direct benefit of companies to healthcare providers and focus on the education. And that's the key is just focusing on education and awareness. Um, direct to consumer is great for pharmaceutical, but with medical technology, it's direct to healthcare providers. And, and I can't say enough how important that educational component of it is. Um, whether it's, you know, a hip replacement, a new knee joint, um, so on those lines, the companies and the healthcare providers need to work hand in hand. There's nothing untoward or unethical. In fact, I think it's demanded by your commitment to patients to have those representatives from the company involved with healthcare providers. And that is something that luckily is not, um, our regulations definitely give a lot of leeway for and is a necessary component to any regulation to respect that um, relationship. All right, thank you. Thank you, Joe, thank you. I think that was quite detailed uh, in terms of, you know, understanding. Uh, so I would like to now, you know, I'm sorry, uh, we, Bill, I've been uh, keeping you waiting for some time, uh, but just, you know, I, I think you're on mute uh, if you can. Yeah, hi. No, no worries. It, it's been super interesting. I'd rather sit here and learn. So I'm, <laughs> then, and hear myself talk. Yeah. <laughs> Shortly, I think you've given a lot of food for thought uh, for last at least 20 minutes. Uh, you know, that is why, you know, I want to come back to you with a question which probably, you know, uh, would be sort of a conclusion to the discussion that we've been doing. Uh, apart from this, you know, if, you know, there are these uh, laws, these are these regulations, uh, we spoke about the best practices. We spoke about the ethical considerations, which need to be done. Right? So these are these are all the events where, uh, when you take advertisements into consideration, you, when you take these uh, as part of your day-to-day -day activity, right? Uh, you want to evaluate the claims. Uh, you know, work hand in hand with the marketing teams, uh, and you know, for the benefit of the company. Uh, when all of these activities are going on, obviously there is it's operationally heavy as well as there is a lot of consideration to be done. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, what are the key challenges do you think these medtech companies are facing in US related to all these advertisement regulations, right? So, you know, some of the challenges that you feel that, you know, probably uh, right now, maybe the government or the regulations are not able to answer at this point in time, or some of the key issues that, you know, should be brought up as a discussion should be brought up for the betterment of the future of the medtech industries. And, uh, Prima facie, they look like, you know, it's just a regulation which needs to be taken up versus, you know, uh, and they are creating challenges because the medtech industry is one of the industries which combines the fastest moving technology evolution along with the need of a human, along with the need of humans with respect to healthcare. So it's, it's an industry which has an impact on two sides versus just an impact, you know, on, uh, you know, just the pharmaceutical or any other side. So could you, you know, put some, you know, put, uh, could you let, you know, people on this panel as well as the attendees understand what are the key challenges that these companies face in terms of the regulations in US? Sure. Well, I think you already uh, brought one up, which was the increasing restrictions on the working with the healthcare providers, which Joe just spoke about. Uh, like he said, 20 
years ago or so, that was a much bigger issue because the attitude of regulators was that doctors are professionals, they regulate themselves, and we don't really have to worry about it when doctors are speaking to the people who make their devices. And that, that's the traditional view in the United States, but it's gone now, um, that the, the policymakers have decided that they don't trust doctors anymore, um, not to, to take what they see as bribes or kickbacks. And so they've cracked down uh, very hard on that. Um, and it started in the 2010s and it, it's still going on. In 2020, a new set of guidance was issued. Um, now doctors are being told again and again that it's very risky to take any gifts from or, or, or to take anything or participate in anything with, uh, with, with uh, the, these clients, these um, medical device uh, manufacturers. Uh, so they're almost too paranoid now and it's, it's an overcorrection that's happening now. And that's a key challenge for the medical device manufacturers uh, because they, can't even, they, they cannot even approach doctors without now there being sort of a stigma. Um, at this point, it, that's what I've been seeing. So that is definitely a key challenge um, and you were right to bring that one up. Um, of course, we another key challenge is just the, the approval process versus the market needs. Uh, medical device industry is extremely fast paced in, in the US. I can't speak for any other country. I imagine that India is no different. And the regulators, uh, they do try, I, th I think with with medical devices, it's hard to complain because when you compare the approval process for a medical device in the U.S. versus a drug, um, the the medical device process is much less onerous, in my opinion, and it can be done quickly, especially if you're working off of approved pre-approved technology, um, and you plan it out correctly. You can get approval within a matter of months, many times. So, um, but still, that that can those months are very valuable, especially when you're racing with a competitor to get something to market. Um, there could be millions of dollars at stake in those months and each one of those months as they go by. Um, and then another one I would be remiss if as the American, one of the American panelists I did not point out of all the different uh, regulatory agencies we have, uh, people in other countries I, I find are often surprised to, to hear about um, all the regulators that our clients deal with. At the federal level, we have two main regulators, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, their Center for Devices and Radiological Health. They're supposed to be the main one. We also have the Federal Trade Commission though, which, is, uh, which regulates unfair and deceptive acts or practices in, in advertisement. Um, they are cracking down on, on various forms of, of advertising and promoting that impacts our medical device manufacturers. Um, on top of that, we have competition law or antitrust as we call it. Um, and the competition law regulators are also looking more closely at the medical device industry. There is a, and, and medical device industry sort of dovetails into tech, right? Because in both the tech industry and the medical device industry, you have this situation where um, new devices are coming out and um, the people who make those devices want to own everything about them, um, including perhaps the right to repair them, the right to service them. And uh, we have a lot of our manufacturers in the United States, uh, the big ones are very aggressive with those practices and the, um, like Joe said, it takes about 15 years for the regulators to come back and do something about anything, but we're at that point now with the uh, repair and service issues where the, um, the, the competition authorities are coming in. Um, but on top of that, which I think is all normal, those are the three uh, areas that the federal government would be expected to regulate. You cannot forget that we have the state governments. So every state has its own version of the federal government. And um, you might, the, the uh, medical device industry is not safe just because they've been able to satisfy every federal regulator there is. You also have 
state attorney generals, elected officials in every state who run massive offices within their states. And they will um, typically not investigate a nationwide practice on their own, but they have a history of doing multi-state investigations where um, the attorney generals of many states will identify a practice they want to go after and join forces to bring a, uh, a lawsuit typically in federal court. Um, so you, you really have to, you really have to watch all of these different regulators all at once when you do something. Um, so th what ends up happening is a lot of people just copy what the others have been doing for a long time. And this, the best practice is really to just stick with what has been tolerated for a long time and has never caused controversy. And, but if you wanna go beyond that, and it's probably a good business decision to do so in many cases, then you, it requires uh, you know, the investment of legal counsel upfront so that you don't have to pay me to deal with the litigation on the back end of it. No, I think, thank you, thank you, Willem. I think it was very, very informative. Uh, and I think some of the points that you made uh, from India standpoint or the Southeast Asian standpoint, I think we are still in that phase there. We probably move into that direction, uh, you know, as per our evolving laws. Uh, I'd just like to bring in Miru and Anuranjan if you want to react to uh, some of the challenges which are faced in US in terms of you know how uh, you know how we uh, how in India you know Indian uh, these same companies when they operate in India uh, at, with different set of regulations or different set of advertisements uh, and a lot of this comes down from. US or Europe, wherever the parent companies are. Uh, but the challenges in India we face are pretty unique to the uh, continent that we have. Uh, so if you could bring in some reaction to the challenges in India. Uh, Miri, if you want to go start with some of it, uh, you can start and I mean, then you can just follow with that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joe and uh, Bill. That was really, really helpful. And I, I personally feel that, yes, that's now that side is a little more developed uh, as against, you know, in India, what we are missing is clear cut laws. So there are quite a number of uh, regulations uh, which are there, but it's like out of which quite a number of our guidelines and voluntary in nature and evolving in nature. So, uh, you know, what we need to, what we should have and we are looking forward is, you know, highest possible ethical standards. And, you know, we should just go one step beyond uh, of where we are and you know we we, we should be a uh, little more a uh, little more stringent in the aspects of interacting with hcps coming up with advertisements and making it as a norm which ultimately i think you know should be for uh, which which should actually help the patient at last because this is what we all are there for this is what we believe that ultimate consumer or the user uh, is is uh, benefited, and so be that it's a competition law, be that it's drugs and control law, be that it's uh, you know any other law which which we are taking care of consumer protection laws. The ultimate health is to be there to the consumer. He should be having the choices, and uh, the doctor's view should not be actually forced. Is what the main behind reason should be. So. Uh, considering the paucity of time, I think, you know, we have a few more uh, pointers. Over to you, Anurajan. Thank you. Thank you, Pratnesh. Thank you. Thank you, Mili. Yeah. Yes, Anurajan. No, I think most of the points have been covered. And uh, means as Joe, Bill, and Meru, both, all of them have uh, indicated that, uh, you know, the fact that this is evolving and there was a little freedom that used to be there probably the industry did not self-regulate. So there are different kinds of a guidelines that are coming up. Now, these guidelines are also not that straightforward and clear. Sometimes they regulate the healthcare professionals. Sometimes they give some leeway to the companies that you can do up to. So as, as Miro suggested, you know, and, and you started this discussion that we need to maintain a highest level of highest level of ethical standards in this in dealing with it. And I think that is what we need to believe. We should 
we we should engage in activities which we really believe that is necessary and important for an intermediary in servicing its patient that is where i think we should try and probably patronize any kind of uh, relationship or, uh, or or giving some incentive to them incentive may be a wrong term absolutely wrong i'm saying that probably helping them to deliver their services in, in to the patients so i'm saying that is where it is the laws have they evolved probably no i think it is for the organization to set up a ethical standards and to me i absolutely and personally believe gift should be absolutely no unless it is going to aid to the uh, to the end user that is the philosophy that it needs to work upon now this may be acceptable not acceptable but i think that is the place where we should start with I, I I think it also instills a lot of confidence in the government and the regulators if you start from that position and then you justify if there are cases where you need to do it. So that, that's my view on this. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ranjan. Thank you, Miru. I think uh, some very, very valid points. Uh, I just want to mention for all the attendees, we also have a few poll questions. I think first one is already flashed up uh, and I think even the second one is there now. Uh, please uh, do answer those. Uh, you know, we would be very keen to understand uh, some of the exciting results that we get for the poll. Uh, just so moving ahead from advertisement to awareness, right? Uh, probably the second half of the discussion. Uh, one which uh, probably slightly less regulated, uh, but has heavy interaction with the NCPs. Uh, in terms of, I think, uh, the penetration of healthcare in India is always a concern. And even now, I think all efforts are being made to ensure that uh, penetration uh, with respect to awareness for diseases or with respect to the devices or with respect to treatments uh, reaches to the highest of the highest level. And in, in that particular activity, I feel that interactions between medtech companies and doctors uh, is extremely important. Twofold, it is important for the medtech companies to educate the doctors in terms of the innovations and the products that they bring in. Uh, it becomes very essential that the products are used in the right manner, the products are used uh, for the benefit of the patients. And second, when the consent is required from patients in terms of understanding these products, or the effects or the therapies, you know, you may want to call them as therapies, uh, considering one particular product is part of the therapy, which a couple of companies uh, produce or, you know, affects a particular diseases, uh, especially you can say uh, devices in the non-communicable diseases, right, coronary or your oncology or dialysis. Uh, it is very important that the, the interaction with HCPs during awareness or in the awareness activities is as per the norms under these regulations. Uh, so from, for this discussion, you know, to start initial this discussion, uh, initially we went from India to US, now we would like to go from US to India. So I would like to bring in William to the, for this conversation. And uh, William, I want to understand what role do awareness activities and public education campaigns play in promoting safe and effective use of medical devices in the United States? And how do they interplay with medical device advertisements and regulations? So, you know, how do you, how, what kind of regulations do you see in terms of safe and effective use? And how is it communicated in these awareness campaigns? How much is branding a part of it? Uh, how do you put out if if suppose I give an example, X company uh, is doing an activity, but also wants to ensure that their brand is recalled in that activity. So what are the rules and regulations in certain scenarios in US? Sure, thank you, uh, Prednesh. Uh, before I answer, I, I just wanted to call out a Nuran Han's sentiment. I, I could not agree more and I, I actually really liked um, the message he's bringing, which is um, the, it starts with the manufacturers being ethical for, for their own purposes, because they want to be seen as legitimate 
um, because they are legitimate and they are they are uh, providing a essential function. We all know how essential it is. There isn't really a good reason to puff things up or to giving gifts to uh, healthcare providers um, because that really cheapens everything that they are doing, which is saving lives and, and vastly improving lives. And that's enough. Um, and as long as, I, I think it's a great message to say, um, stick to uh, walking the walk, not just talking the talk, walk the walk and, and be uh, ethical. And that will prevent, you know, whatever headaches you're having with the regulations. And I, I do think that's what happened in the United States when it came to physician gifts and, and those things. I mean, uh, for the long, for a very long time, for decades and decades, the medical um, industry was trusted to deal directly with the physicians who self-regulate themselves. And both of those industries had a very high, were held in a very high regard. Um, and but the the gift giving and the um, the schmoozing, it it was it got kind of out of hand and everybody noticed it and, and everybody started to see how sleazy it was. And that results in the crackdown. And now the, the industry is worse for that because now the public perceives that, well, if the government isn't stopping them from schmoozing with each other and giving each other gifts, then they would be doing it. Um, it, it was a much better place 20 years ago when it just wasn't happening, or I should say 30 years ago or 40 years ago when it just wasn't happening. And so the, there wasn't a problem to solve. Uh, I don't mean to uh, dodge your question, Pradnish. Um, obviously, the you, you asked me what role do awareness activities play in promoting the safe and effective use of medical devices, and I, obviously there there is a great role. Um, the the healthcare providers, even though we do have direct to consumer advertising in the med tech industry, healthcare providers are are by and large the way that these devices are going to reach the end user. So it's, it, it's extremely important to engage with the healthcare providers still. Um, the, the, the advertising of med tech has not really taken off in the US as it, had, it has with uh, pharmaceuticals. So um, the, the most important activity is still to, to um, interact with the healthcare providers. And another thing that um, I'd point out is just the, the healthcare finance system or the healthcare insurance system we have in the US is extremely complicated. Um, people tend to get their healthcare paid for by their work through healthcare insurance. However, there are many exceptions to that. There are massive government programs that uh, cover people who are at a certain poverty level, Medicaid, and people who are over a certain age, Medicare, generally 65 or above. So everything that you do as a med tech company must be done with the idea of, am I selling this? Is this going to be something that insurance is going to pay for? And if so, I need to, I need to sit down and, and really analyze whether I'm going to have an issue with Medicare or Medicaid or the, the large insurance companies here. If not, then it's something you're going to be doing. Um, maybe, you know, the easiest example would be something cosmetic uh, a cosmetic device, insurance is not going to cover that. So you're in a different world really because now you are trying to sell the, um, the functionality of your product uh, that, that's to a, to a provider, but the provider has this business need, this great business need to be able to sell that to their patient. Um, so, um, and the medical device manufacturers generally tend to take the laboring or when it comes to um, producing promotional materials that will support the product that they sell to healthcare providers as part of working with healthcare providers here. All right, thank you, thank you, William. Uh, I think uh, with that, let me ask Joe, and I think we also have webinar chat. I think this question is probably you know would answer both the questions with respect to webinar chat. Uh, what impact do the prevalent re regulations have on the awareness campaigns? 
and initiatives related to healthcare in the United States. So what are the prevalent regulations in the US which have a direct impact? Yeah, um, the underlying regulations of the Food and Drug Federal Trade Commission, the idea is these campaigns, these awareness campaigns have to be truthful, not misleading, and also, I guess, put up front any issues. So I guess the, the best illustration of this would be to kind of echo Bill, this is most on the pharmaceutical side when you actually see advertisements um, for drugs, we get them all the time. It is a big, it's across all of our TVs, it's across radio, it's pop-up ads, it's everything. But the ad will be, say it's 30 minutes spot, and the first 10 sec, sorry, 30 second advertisement, the first 10 seconds says, don't you want this? Like, you want to live like this? You want um, somehow promoting that this drug will help you if you have certain conditions. And then the next 20 seconds, so two thirds of it is explaining all of the potential side effects and all the negative elements of that drug. And then telling you, oh, but make sure, and with the disclaimer, talk to your healthcare provider. They're the person you should go to. So our regulations have created a situation where these advertisements don't, it's not like a McDonald's hamburger or something like that where it's all good and all amazing, but to comply with truthfulness and making sure you're declaring side effects and um, you see these advertisements where they almost are, you know, half negative. It's telling you that to help your issue with um, whatever issue someone might have, that you're also going to have to suffer through these, these other side effects. Um, so the reason why I always find that funny is that not only is that an eye on various types of regulations for how these companies can advertise, it's a perfect reflection on kind of the healthcare system here and the philosophies that are underlying it, that the companies are worried, one, about running afoul of the regulations and being misleading, but two, they're also worried about even if they hit, even if they are completely fine by government regulations, we have a very litigious society. They are concerned about liability, kind of where Bill and I would come in there on the legal side, that we are um, a country that has a lot of class action lawsuits and various types of things. So that if there is any issue with a medical device or with a pharmaceutical um, product, you know that in 10 years, there's gonna be a massive lawsuit, whether it's brought by the government or brought by individuals. Um, so this, these advertisements reflect that reality. Additionally, they reflect the reality that the healthcare industry is 18% of the US GDP. So even with that, these advertisements, it makes so much sense for these companies to continue to advertise. Um, that is on the, the advertisement um, side. Awareness, I kind of, I, I don't want to continue to belabor the, uh, the point that um, the pharmaceuticals are doing great on awareness. If there's a product out there that these pharmaceuticals want to pitch, everyone knows the name. Um, the de medical devices direct to healthcare providers um, and the gifts and stuff like that. And I, I do want to kind of take a, maybe a slightly different position than other people here is that the, the regulations prohibiting gifts They've been good and have brought a lot of um, hopefully trust to the industry. But the reality on the ground is that um, the regulations are pretty easy in some ways to get around. Oh, you can't buy dinners, you can't buy drinks for healthcare providers. What that ends up coming up is that what I've seen, unfortunately, is healthcare representatives, device representatives would um, be like, well, I'm just going to host a seminar similar to what we're doing here to talk about this, but it's going to just happen to be at the bar that's near the surgeon's house. And I'm going to let him know and only him know, and he can bring all of his friends and family and it's going to be, I'm going to cater it. So it's going to be this extravagant party that I'm paying for that 
you know, that I don't have to declare on the show. There's no record of it because I was just hosting a seminar and catering a seminar where I was talking about this information. But in reality, I've given a healthcare provider and his friends and family a great meal and all the drinks that they could drink and a great party. So there are holes in the law still, but I'll, I'll let you take it from here, Fred Nash. All right, thank you, thank you, Joe. Uh, I think one of our uh, attendees, uh, you know, just wanted to understand that if you know, in terms of print me print media, right? Uh, are there any tests in U.S. law that you would, you know, probably uh, check into or look into, uh, you know, before you take any of these content in the print world? Uh, could be a brochures, could be a pamphlets, any advertising material. So, Joe, if you have any, uh, you know, insight on that, maybe a very small uh, answer to, you know, uh, to one of our attendees who has posted a question on the chat, and then probably you can take it forward from there. Um, the underlying concept here, and the exact wording of it escapes me, but um, it's, you have to declare the side effects, the common side effects, um, you have to, you can't be misleading, you can't overpromise. I think it's in a lot of ways similar to what you have in India where print, you know, if there's any sort of um, over, you can't overpromise on these things. You, you have to be very clear. And kind of as I was getting into with our um, commercials, side effects have to be clearly said, the common side effects. So obviously that on the background, all the testing and the um, getting approval and everything, side effects are always identified. It has to be very clear um, up to, you know, even the terrible things where you can take, you take this medication and it can be that you're, you know, you might lose sleep and then all the way up to like, could cause death. Like the, we have a lot of that in our thing. So misleading and declaring um, the, the side effects. I don't know, Bill, if you had any other things that the, there's a specific test that escapes me at this moment for print advertisement because that's just not a common. All right, all right. Thank you, thank you, Joe. Thank you so much uh, for taking that uh, question. Uh, so I think I'll now head back to, you know, Anurajan and Neil uh, for some similar question on the same lines, you know, in terms of, uh, let me bring in Anurajan for this one uh, first, uh, because, you know, he is such a varied experience in touring India and the other markets. So Anurajan would like to know, you know, for therapy awareness activities, if you compare those to other regions in Southeast Asia, uh, what are some of the best learnings that you would have seen uh, in the awareness activities? And Pradesh, uh, you know, when we talk about awareness and therapy awareness, I just wanted to probably bring and create a distinction. Uh, one is therapy awareness and education to the healthcare professional. Yes. And the second part is of therapy education awareness to the patient. And if I were to talk about the first case of therapy awareness or education to the healthcare professional, probably I don't see much of a difference across the region. In fact, uh, they, you know, in interactions with the healthcare professionals, I have seen that the laws do permit and support to have a very open discussions vis-a-vis -vis your product for that particular therapy. So in your interactions with the, with the healthcare professionals, you can talk about, about your product and how it will help the healthcare professional, how it will help the patients for, on the use of the product. So I, I don't think there's much of a difference on that that I see, but what I have experienced is that in some of the jurisdiction, and as you started with the discussion on the awareness, very much linked with the penetration and the availability of the healthcare professional or trained professionals to actually educate the patient to identify a symptom for a, which requires some kind of a health uh, ad, healthcare ad, practitioners advice or, or or attention. To me, that is more of a therapy awareness program. 
in some of the markets, I've seen that it is pretty well defined. There's a structure that has been there. I'm not aware that if there is such kind of a structure that has been uh, at least brought in even in an industry code in India. Uh, so to me, that is an area where we can do a little better by creating some guidelines for the companies to do a therapy education. And of course, it cannot be linked to the product. It cannot be linked to the, to the treatment options. It is about for people to identify how they can and when at what stage they can seek uh, the healthcare professional support. And, and probably in India, like th there has been so much of a discussion on topics like depression, where people don't even identify it, that it is there. But actually it is, it requires people to be aware that if you are showing these kind of symptoms, then you need to go to the healthcare professional. Uh, to rely only on the government or the healthcare professional, given the workload that they have, I think it is a little challenging. And this is where I think we have, we in India have to have some learning from the other markets. And probably this is one of the best practice that I identify that can be implemented. Thank you, thank you, Uh So I, for the same question, I would like to call Miru. Uh, but Miru, I want to ask slightly different over here. Okay, I'm not throwing a curveball right now. Uh, by the end of the this thing, uh, but you know, I know that you for a fact that you also uh, work in the neighboring countries other than India, like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and you know, you cover the IIC as a region. So, if you could answer this question with your experience in IIC as a region, uh, you know, would be very helpful. Miru, you are on mute. So this is a pet statement. You are on mute during the COVID times. <laughs> uh, so um, th thanks for this question. And definitely, you know, since I'm looking forward, for, I mean, I'm looking at India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, all these other countries are a little step below as to how India is. So, you know, the regulations or the processes, what we follow out over here in, in India, is the best practice we do out over there. And I, as I said earlier, you know, in India also, or be that any of the neighboring countries or Asia Pacific, anywhere uh, across the globe, we've been following the strictest possible laws as against, you know, taking into consideration what Indian law specifically or Bangladesh law is talking about. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always good uh, that, you know, ultimate uh, consumer or the patient health should be taken care of. And as Anuranjan rightly stated, you know, there are two types of awareness. One is an awareness of the HCP professionals. So awareness to a HCP professional is basically more on B2B, uh, you know, training them, telling them, uh, or seeking their feedback for more development of uh, equipment, et cetera, which is, which is fine. You are not giving anything, uh, any gift to them free of cost, or you're not giving them any samples, et cetera, et cetera. So which is, do we, which is, which is, which is uh, actually there and we don't, this is not allowed and should not be done to incite them to give orders to you. And then if you talk about, uh, you know, giving uh, awareness sessions or trainings to uh, to the patient at large, yes. I think, you know, as, as again, what other panelists have discussed when you talk about depression, et cetera, uh, there are also so many other, you know, pointers which companies have started taking from a CSR perspective within India say like PCOS and other depression pro issues, polycystic ovaries, which is going direct to the consumer. So I think, you know, awareness to them without any cost and giving them free sort of a training to make them understand and tell them to they should know is something which is effective and is not against law is what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Vibhu. Thank you so much. Uh, so, you know, with this, we sort of done with the question, uh, I think in terms of, we are also done with the time. Uh, we have some three, couple of minutes left. Uh, we have some, uh, we have three poll questions running parallelly. Uh, one second. And some of those poll questions have been answered, uh, you know, by the team. I'll just request my team to flash the poll results. 
So our first question was, do you think Indian regulations surrounding advertisements and promotional activities are enough to regulate unfair trade practices with respect to misleading advertisements? And, you know, I think it resonates with what Anuranjan also said as, you know, mutually what he felt. Uh, and you, you also supported, I think we have around 93% of people feeling that, no, these are not enough. Uh, probably we need to have more uh, stricter or codified law in terms of understanding it. Uh, it could be simpler in nature, but it needs to address the point. Uh, and I think that is what the voice of the opinion has come through. Uh, the second question, uh, what we had asked was, do you think brand recall items or brand reminders offered to HCPs by medical representatives should be allowed? Here, the house is divided, which is uh, quite interesting. You know, if uh, we've got 47% yes and 53% saying no. Right. So I think brand recalls and brand reminders, uh, you know, there should be a way uh, of, you know, how do you do those things if they're just being done to NCPs. I think a complete no-no would also not address the uh, marketing issues that probably companies face in terms of, you know, the kind of uh, money that they spend in this market with respect to innovation, with, re with respect to bringing new uh, products to the market and therefore, uh, having the right profitability to these businesses is equally important because they are the ones who are leading the innovation from the front. Uh, if anyone wants to react to this particular question for, with respect to brand recall, brand trade, please the house, uh, the floor is open or I will move on to the last one. Anurajan, I think you want to say something. I can see you smiling. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think this is a separate topic and it can take a lot of <laughs> time. But I personally believe uh, in space of a healthcare, I do understand that there is a need for a brand recall. Uh, but I, I feel there are other ways to create that awareness about the brand than to actually give gift. Because to me, whether it is related, not related, it can create certain perceptional issues, which is given the environment in which we operate, given the baggage the industry is carrying at this point of time, the focus that it is there, I would be, I would probably be taking more conservative view on a gift or for just for a re recall value. Okay, okay. Thank you. Miru, do you want to say something? I'll no. the third question. No, I, I, uh, I, I totally resonate with what Anuranjan said because, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I mean, for one given point of time, you can just buy that period in time, but then uh, the, the damage it may cost in future or any sort of reputational issues, you keep on, you know, make, I mean, discussing or arguing and stating in the court of laws in India, but, you know, that will not come back. Hence, it's better to be very conservative, better to say no, as against saying that, sorry, ignorance is no excuse. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Joe, Bill, if anyone wants to react uh, to this one, <laughs> to the, the with the brand recall items, uh, I, I think I take a similar view that like it's not worth it from the perception side. But I do like that it was a split poll amongst the attendees because it there there is some you know I guess benefit to it. It's usually in conjunction, at least in my experience. You know, these brand recall items are a, a pen or a, a notepad or something. They're very tiny. They're not very valuable in and of themselves. Um, but it's usually in conjunction with legitimate work that's being done to educate and to inform and to work through these, these especially medical uh, devices, work through how they're going to function in the operating room or with a, uh, with a patient. Um, so I, I personally don't see much of an issue with it, but when I put my lawyer hat on, I, I tell him no, like, let's just not, why, why even, why not be conservative? <laughs> Actually, the problem is that, you know, till the time we say pen is fine, but then the pen becomes a mobile bank, then it is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. I, I didn't say what type of pen, you're right, so. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, you know, this, let me just go to the third one again, the how, I mean, it was 94%, uh, 
the question was how important and relevant do you think training and education activities are with regards to new medtech products and technologies for NCP and to instill latest and innovative medical practices in the healthcare sector. I think we all know that that's the good work what the companies are doing. And, uh, you know, they should continue doing this. Innovation is re really, uh, you know, taking, uh, it's super fast. And that's why, you know, this series is called Galloping Medtech Industry. You know, and we do understand and recognize it. Uh, we want to be the voice to see if we can make some change. Uh, Medtech industry is a sleeping giant, but we, we are trying to awake it a little bit. At least. So, you know, with this, uh, I want to thank everyone. Uh, thank you, Anuranjan. Uh, it is a pleasure that you removed your time from your busy schedule and you're part of this, uh, you know, webinar. Uh, thank you, Miru. Uh, you know, uh, it's a pleasure. It's always good to talk to you on these uh, topics and discussions, uh, you know, the past year that we worked. And, uh, you know, great to, uh, you know, see that, you know, you could remove your time to be on this webinar as well. Uh, William and Joe, uh, I can't thank you enough. Uh, you know, uh, I know it will be too early in uh, Chicago right now. Uh, you made time for us, uh, you know, in terms of even attending, uh, you know, discussions. Uh, what everyone sees is uh, the one hour webinar, but the effort behind, you know, this one hour has been tremendous for last one month. And I really thank everyone on this panel uh, to be part of this. Uh, I mean, just invite Mr. if he wants to just thank the panel who is. Uh, of course, of course, Pranish, thank you very much. This was, <clears throat> I'm sure everybody has enjoyed uh, the discussion. And I think there was very useful insight that has come out. And I hope that as a firm, we'll be able to collate this information, put it in a paper. And, you know, we could pr probably influence uh, these kind of discussions definitely influence over a period of time how the industry moves thank you very much joe will miru we really appreciate it and anuranjan of course thank you very much for coming and uh, and sparing from your busy schedules for this webinar thank you very much have a lovely thank you. Day. Thank you, Pranesh. Thank thanks, Nusrat. And thanks, everybody. Means Joe and Bill. It's thank nice you. getting connecting with yes. you. And yeah. nice knowing you, Miru. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Good. I mean, good work. I mean, Pranesh. I know there's a lot of effort behind this. We've, you've, been, you've been pushing all of us to give you some time and be with you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate this and happy to be part of sessions like this. Thank you. And thank you very much for the, for the participants who have. Uh, and I hope you have found this useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.